Welcome everyone. I'm Kaya Schilda. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Europe here at Party School. I'm also a Jean Monnet professor of European Security and Defense. And I say that because that comes with a, a small budget to do some agenda setting work around uh, the topic. And so the topic that we're inviting young um, and, and emerging and um, established scholars to, to discuss is around the Europe and the world theme. And it's a theme that really just explores the embeddedness, um, and historical legacies, colonial legacies of Europe, the EU, on the rest of the world, and vice versa. Um, and to critically reflect on human and regional security in terms of legacies, responsibilities, impacts, um, and, and contemporary responsibilities of Europe and the world in terms of Europe <coughs> as a problem and a, you know, a, a source of insecurity in the world, but also um, a provider of global governance in terms of security, human, regional, and national. Um, and so in that, in that light, we have today, um, I'm very excited to welcome um, Nate Grau, who's a doctoral candidate in history at Harvard. And he's currently an Ernst May Fellow in History and Policy at Harvard Kennedy School, the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. Uh, he's been a Fulbright Fellow at the University of Paris Nanterre and holds various previous degrees from Columbia University and NYU. His dissertation project is called France's Forgotten Soldiers, and it examines the evolving roles of paramilitary forces in the French army during decolonization conflicts in Madagascar, Indochina, and Algeria. His interests broadly include counterinsurgency, European defense, and sectarian violence. He's particularly interested in the stories of indigenous soldiers who remained loyal to France during the wars of decolonization and how they shaped the evolution and politicization of the French officer corps during that period. So, as I said to Nate when I welcomed him, I wish I were had been a historian, and so I'm living my best <laughs> life through wonderful inviting scholars um, like Nate to uh, present his ongoing research. Welcome. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, I can only hope that I just am so grateful for this opportunity to present, and also for the selection of papers that are presenting here because I've noticed there is a, a much more pronounced Gallic theme. You know, it's good to see my fellow fellow scholars of French. Uh, have the opportunity to speak on, on European uh, affairs. Uh, but I, I want to start this talk specifically uh, with a reflection, as we see on the slide, of the not-so-very-French face of the French war effort in southern Indochina. Circa 1948, and pictured on this slide, we see bespeckled on the left Nguyen Van Tine, a man who had commanded Japanese-aligned paramilitary forces in March 1945, as they evicted, arrested, or killed French administrators during Japan's seizure of power in Indochina. And to his right, holding what I can only describe as a spectacular cigarette filter, is the protector of the Khao Dai faith, Pham Kong Tak, uh, who was saved from the apparently not so damaging stigma of Japanese collaboration only because he had already been imprisoned and exiled from Indochina in 1941. Fewer than three years after the end of the Second World War, these two men directed a sprawling paramilitary force numbering in the thousands, a force that the local French commander, Pierre Boyer de la Tour, described as absolutely essential to France's pacification efforts in southern Indochina. But the Khao Dai religious sect controlled a sprawling fiefdom where they levied taxes, they took in French weapons, and they also took in suitcases literally stuffed full of cash. From these autonomous territories, they sometimes supported the French army in the collaborationist Vietnamese government in Cochin, China that France had installed in 1946. This is, after all, what they had agreed to do. Um, and sometimes, though, they, they didn't. And the French archives are absolutely replete with uh, stories of the, the Khao Dai brandishing their French-supplied rifles uh, against the Viet Minh guerrillas, who are their ostensible enemies and who are the purpose of their alliance with the French army, but also against French police officers and the civilians who are unfortunate enough to live in the zones that they controlled. But what were these notorious Japanese collaborators, now brandishing French rifles, doing here? And what kind of polity would align with such a group? These are the questions that I explore in my dissertation topic. French officials throughout this period were self-consciously revolutionary in their outlook. 
as early as January 1941, that's seven years before the picture in the previous slide, the Governor General of French Equatorial Africa, Félix Eboué, a free Frenchman, declared no le the necessity of no less than a peaceful revolution for saving the French Empire from stagnation. Yet as reformers like Eboué set about enacting what they viewed as revolutionary expansions in voting rights, commitments to economic development, and the decentralization of decision-making to officials at the local level, French reformers in the colonies were forced to confront actual revolutions. Colonized people, subjected to decades of violence, extraction, and expropriation, rose up in arms after 1945 to take by force the independence that France's civilizing mission had always promised but never delivered. My project, outlined here, examines the violence that occurred when France's reformist revolution from above collided with grassroots revolutions from below in Madagascar, Indochina, and Algeria from 1945 to 1962. By the time of Algerian independence in 1962, an imperial administration that had anchored its rule in human rights, social development, and self-determination, or had at least professed to follow these values, had killed both hundreds of thousands of its own people and ignited brutal civil wars in each of the cases that I study in my dissertation. Today, I'll, I'll be exploring what the tension between humanitarianism and mass violence looked like in Indochina. And a hint, it looked a lot like Pham Kong Tak and his Khao Dai paramilitaries. More specifically, I'll be discussing uh, chapters one and three of my dissertation, which you can see bolded here. That traces the circulation of a novel colonial reformist ideology, which I call racial flourishing or panuisement racial, from Free France's early capital in French equatorial Africa to the southern Vietnamese colony of Cochin, China, where we've already seen in Tak one of its most poignant manifestations. So why did self-conscious French efforts to expand the political rights of colonial subjects, protect minority populations, and raise material living standards coincide with such a dramatic and equally unprecedented spike in colonial state violence? Speaking uh, to my social scientist colleagues out there, my project began from a place of curiosity about the correlation between these two phenomena, that is, reform and mass violence. My dissertation fieldwork, which uh, you can see here, consisted of multinational uh, archival research as well as oral history interviews, um, revealed not only that colonial reform provided a justification for acts of violence, both by state officials and also the uh, subnational armed groups that are aligned with the French state, groups like the Khao Dai, for example, but often that it was the same individual personnel who, say, established rural village councils uh, and then mobilized the villagers within that council to kill their neighbors. If you have any questions about this research, I'm happy uh, to answer them during the Q&A or anything. But really the point here is to establish that the research design is multinational and that over the course of this dissertation year, I have essentially transformed uh, into a walking ad for French tourism, as any of my friends uh, will tell you. But to my fellow historians, if there are any of you here, uh, I would put my research question somewhat differently. Why did figures who refused to collaborate with the Nazis, who openly proclaimed that the colonial status quo wouldn't work anymore, even under the, the Popular Front or in the Third Republic, and who proposed radical solutions, self-consciously revolutionary solutions, why did these Republican reformers adopt such cataclysmic violence when anti-colonial nationalists resisted them? To me, this isn't a story of inherently evil people doing bad stuff. It, rather, I want to get at whether there's something in the substance of Free France's reform program that either facilitated or enabled such extreme violence. The stories that historians largely have told about the evolution of French tactics in Indochina and the development of France's Cold War counterinsurgency doctrine, which is called, uh, for those interested, Revolutionary War or Guerre Revolutionnaire, it, it makes a great deal of sense from the vantage of the Vietnamese typically national standpoint, that is the normal point of departure for these studies. In this narrative, this traditional received narrative, French soldiers responding to intractable resistance from the Viet Minh basically did whatever they could to uh, fashion solutions, develop tactics, or establish alliances like with the Khao Dai. Though uh, through a painful and traumatizing process of lessons learned and ultimately defeat we know in 1954, <coughs> as well as through reading the works of communist revolutionary theorists like Mao Zedong, for example, 
they developed a, a coherent counterinsurgency doctrine which they used to really devastating effect in the next colonial war they fought in Algeria uh, before exporting it outward across the globe. And an example of this is that in the U.S. counterinsurgency doctrine, uh, they still cite France's experiences in Vietnam and Algeria as sort of lessons learned. But in my opinion, the most consequential export of this doctrine is to the military junta in Argentina and Brazil, which is a lot of where the current scholarship uh, is going in this area. The political platform or broader, broader ideological vision of the French state here, though, is, is noteworthy in these narratives for its absence. Where civilians or civil institutions are mentioned at all, they're, they're seen as inept or incompetent advocates of a humanitarianism that's really superficial or just a window dressing for what is in fact a military campaign of extreme and dysfunctional violence. A whole literature has arisen decrying the lost soldiers of Indochina and Algeria who were forced, so the story goes, to adopt political roles in the absence of any guidance from state authorities. Contrary to this established wisdom and periodization, I contend that the answers to my research questions can be found neither in Indochina nor amongst French soldiers. Rather, I, I look first to the program of imperial reforms that free French administrators embraced during and after the Second World War. Colonial officials asserted a relatively stable set of imperial obligations and rights over the three revolutionary wars in 16 years that I studied in my project. They articulated a vision of their empire fractured into what they described as a mosaic of mutually antagonistic peoples, spread across a hierarchy of what they labeled social evolution or civilization. In the name of minority rights and often expressing the language of the League of Nations or the United Nations, they asserted France's enduring right to function as arbiter between these supposedly antagonistic peoples claiming that they alone possess, possess the resources and social scientific expertise to ensure the development or evolution of the colonized. Finally, they territorialized and then militarized the ethnic principle of rule across imperial space and time. Territorial partitions and differentiated legal regimes promising to protect, quote, less evolved peoples, they split the territories of Madagascar, Indochina, and Algeria into patchworks of protectorates, faux trusteeship zones, federal territories, and special administrative zones. The effect of this, of course, was ethno-religious elites like Femme Contact co-opting the resources of the colonial state and engaging in uh, vast amounts of intercommunal violence. Violence that was designed both to consolidate their power internally and to push the boundaries of the fiefdoms that they established. But the mutually constitutive nature of reform and violence, in my view, goes deeper still than that. As we'll see today in the case of French coach in China, it was in the areas that French civil administrators acted most vigorously, enshrining constitutional protections for minority rights or trying to democratize rural decision-making bodies, just to name two examples, that French counterinsurgent practices took their most de developed, coherent, and in my view, extreme forms. So what I mean here is that civilian officials tackling the legal problems of minority protections or the more practical issues of peasant rural development. They unwittingly furnished French and later Vietnamese uh, counterinsurgents with a, a platform, literally an institutional platform, for the conduct of rural counterinsurgency operations in the years ahead. But to understand how we got here, we have to turn our analytic gaze to a time and a place that historians of the Vietnam Wars, and not to mention the history of Western counterinsurgency, really don't look very often and that's to the French Empire in late 1940. I expect most of us here are familiar with the story of the fall of France, an episode where France's, or excuse me, Europe's strongest military collapsed in a matter of weeks. As the historian Ernest May elucidates in his amazing and magisterial work, Strange Victory, and I'm not just saying that because I am myself an Ernest May fellow, uh, France's army acquitted itself well on the battlefield, but their sclerotic command structure and their outdated doctrine meant that it wasn't enough. And by the end of June 1940, uh, reactionary collaborationist clique under the leadership of Marshal Philippe Pétain had negotiated an armistice with Hitler and taken France, almost all of its empire, and almost all of its army out of the war. Nearly all, except for this man, pictured on the left. Charles de Gaulle, a relatively unknown brigadier general who escaped to London and charged all French people with continuing the fight against Nazism. His call of 18 June 1940, which is pictured here, 
went almost certainly or almost entirely unanswered and unheard until August 1940, when Governor Félix Eboué, the highest ranking man of color in the French colonial administration, declared his colony Chad for Free France, a process that began a chain reaction that brought all of French Equatorial Africa, pictured here and abbreviated AEF, uh, under de Gaulle's authority. This was the first significant island of sovereignty for free France and, free France and for what Ibwe contended was the inheritor of France's republican imperial tradition. And it's here, in AEF's capital Brazzaville, thousands of miles from Saigon, where our story begins. Now for as militarily and symbolically significant as the rallying of this colony proved to be, and I get emotional every time I read about it, even though it's so, so old, for us the real story here is actually that of a network. Before us is a critically important group of early Gaulists, colonial thinkers, soldiers, and administrators, who were basically just in the right place and chose the right side in French Equatorial Africa in 1940. I've decided against my own desires not to inundate you with a longer list of French names and French officials, but if anyone's interested in discussing this, I would be more than happy to. Rather, I wanna draw your attention to the fact that it's here, in 1940, there's already gathered the future architects of France's post-war counterinsurgency campaign in Indochina, and not only that, but the veritable brain trust of the entire post-war French imperial order, which is called the French Union. The exception here to this rule is Léon Pignon, who's uh, pictured in the bottom left corner of the screen, who joined this network as the colonial ministry's Indochina expert in early 1943. But still, basically from this moment until roughly 1947, and from French Equatorial Africa to Madagascar to Indochina to Algeria, look for any major declaration of French policy or French colonial reform, and you'll find some permutation of these eight people. Historians of the Indochina War, which there aren't any, but maybe someday there will be, will also recognize here the future High Commissioner Georges Thierry d'Argentlieu, his political advisor, the first French commander-in-chief of uh, France's Far Eastern Expeditionary Force, and also Southern Indochina's territorial governor from 1945 to 6. These are individuals whom scholars of this period have attributed uh, a great deal of responsibility for starting the war with the revolutionary Viet Minh in 1946. And my contention is the fact that basically they're all here in AEF in 1940 is not a coincidence. Examining the ideology that this clique embraced after 1940 and then brought with them to Indochina is in my view essential to explain the early trajectory of the war, and so that's what we're going to do. So what was the vision of this Gaulist diaspora? The response to this question came, unsurprisingly, from Eboué himself and also his lieutenant, Henri Laurenti, who's pictured in the previous slide. And it came in the form of the new native policy, which is pictured on the left. Ostensibly a plan to develop Equatorial Africa's resources, human and material, to meet the challenges of the Second World War, the new native policy was really, in fact, a transformational blueprint for revolution that revolutionized the debate on colonial reform far beyond 1945. At its core, it proposed the decentralization and fragmentation of economic and political power within France's empire. Ibwe married fragments of the British ideology, indirect rule, or what he called sometimes rule through chiefs, to what was essentially a, a precursor to modernization theory. Each of the empire's many peoples, he contended, had a distinct evolutionary hierarchy and internal social coherence that it was France's duty to preserve in the law. To combat the specter of African social dissolution, which he called detribalization, he advocated the socioeconomic development of African communities by way of so-called traditional institutions. Oftentimes, administrators basically had no idea what the traditional institutions were or who the supposedly ancestral chiefs were that were supposed to run them, and they invented them out of whole cloth. But in some contexts, specifically Indochina and Madagascar, they looked for inspiration to the purportedly ancient deliberative bodies that had existed in rural villages before French colonization. Now, at its most ambitious, the new native policy advocated what amounted to an empire of composed of supranational federations, comprised themselves of ethnically ter uh, territorialized or ethnically segregated territories, managed at the local level by these so-called traditional chiefs or ancestral chiefs. Here in a self-consciously ambitious reform document, we see the first coherent articulation of the concepts undergirding French counterinsurgent violence over the next 16 years. Now within the new native policy, 
itself, democratic institution building, rural development, and the protection of, of ethnic minorities, they, they served what everybody called his peaceful revolution. But these ideas would rapidly be transformed into weapons of civil war, and that began in earnest with the Brazzaville Conference in 1944. Now this was Free France's crowning colonial achievement, a summit of administrators and technicians, and not a single colonial subject, by the way, convened to prepare the empire for uh, the post-war era. Now in the scholarship, Brazzaville is typically understood as either a missed opportunity for genuine reform, or for the people who were there and wrote subsequent histories, it's seen as the herald of France's peaceful decolonization. But if you look and examine it at what the, the, the assembled people there actually agreed on. Brazzaville looks much more like a desperate and highly consequential attempt to ensure that French colonialism could survive in the face of an, of an ascendant American hegemon that was really deeply skeptical of France's imperial mission. By the time of the conference's convening in January 1944, the ideas articulated in the new native policy, ideas that we just discussed, had basically become commonsensical a new imperial organization anchored in federalism, traditionalism, and economic development represented the self-conscious point of departure for the debates here. British observers, and also the French themselves, identified this gathering as, as France's response to the self-determination clause of the 1941 Atlantic Charter. The ethnicized federalism and the recourse to so-called traditional institutions embraced here, they offered French colonialists a new and very obviously self-serving way to interpret this self-determination. One that dressed France's so-called obligations to protect ethnic particularism in the language of international law. That is, French administrators reframed the civilizing mission as an international obligation. A solemn guarantee that each tribe could have the chance to evolve toward self-determination within the framework of its own traditions. The real enemies of self-determination in this fantastical construction were not then French settlers who looted the empire's treasures, worked its people often literally to death, and extracted its human and natural resources with impunity. No, the real enemies of self-determination here were other colonized peoples whose, and the French use this term exactly, imperialism, threatened the social and political development that policymakers at Brazzaville had made it their mission to protect. They called this new obligation a commitment to, quote, the flourishing of local races or panuisement racial. And my contention is that it is impossible to understand the extreme intercommunal violence of France's decolonization without taking this organizing scheme, this ideology, as well as the people who went across the empire to enact it seriously. Now, I hope you can already begin to see kind of where this is going with Indochina and with the French empire more generally. Indeed, the main planners of this conference, Jean Cédille, Léon Pignon, and Henri Laurenti, who were in that initial network slide, they pivoted almost immediately from this conference to planning France's reoccupation of Indochina. Indeed, Brazzaville and the new native policy furnished these three men with the political and intellectual raw materials to engineer a new kind of empire. One, uh, on 24 March 1945, Charles de Gaulle delivered the government's Indochina Declaration, which is pictured on the left. A plan that, despite its name, aimed to establish Brazzaville's decentralized ethnic federalism as the organizational basis for the entire French Empire, which is now renamed, with this document, the French Union. In addition to promises for expanded suffrage and economic development, it confirmed the division of French Indochina into five states, separated on the grounds of, quote, tradition and race. It also critically included promises to elevate the colony's, quote, diverse populations to a degree of civilization equal to their neighbors. France, unsurprisingly, remained at the pinnacle of this proposed federal structure, both as the arbiter of its constituent states and as the guarantor of its minority rights regime. For much of 1945, this theoretical text was really little more, though, than a statement of purpose or a, a declaration of intent, since, as we know, the Japanese and our Kaodai friends had crushed France's colonial administration in March 1945. Still, the Gaullist colonial ministry planning for the reoccupation of the colony, a reoccupation they viewed essentially as inevitable, thought that this program might serve as the basis for a peaceful and more liberal French presence in the future. <coughs> but it was not to be. In September 1945, the revolutionary leader Ho Chi Minh declared Vietnamese independence, invoking the very same principles of self-determination that the French themselves had used in Brazzaville and in the Indochina Declaration. 
to the north in Tonkin, the northern part of Indochina, where there was no armed French presence to speak of. Gaulists, including our friend Léon Pignon, could only negotiate and buy time. But in the south, where French troops were rapidly disembarking and where ongoing power struggles between Vietnamese political factions had already exploded into open conflict, French Republicans saw an opportunity. Long-standing debates on federalism and the territorialization of ethnic difference, they offered Jean Sédil, a Gaullist of 1940 who we've already met, and the man now tasked with stabilizing Indochina beneath the 16th parallel, they offered them ready-made tools for destroying the Viet Minh. And Sedil knew just where to look for allies. Rural Vietnamese notables, non-communist nationalists, and Cambodian or Catholic minorities in the South were already suffering tremendous violence for their independence from Ho Chi Minh. France's returning administrators really couldn't promise these groups all that much. But they could offer weapons, cash, and territorial autonomy in line with the principles outlined in the Indochina Declaration. This was, in, in Pignon's later recounting, a ready means to, quote, displace the dispute between France and the Viet Minh internally onto the Annamites. That's the, the Vietnamese term, or that's the term for Vietnamese that the French used in order to deny the existence of a Vietnamese nation. If France lacked the military means to establish complete control over the South, then with the, the help of these groups, they could at least ensure that no one else could. Professing the same commitments to ethnic pluralism and hum human development that they had embraced since 1941 in Equatorial Africa, the Free French under Cédille armed whatever, quote, allies they could find and set them loose. So began what the historian of this war, Sean McHale, describes as a race war in the South. Over the course of 1945 and 6, the French administration translated this opportunistic alliance building into official administrative practice. I demonstrate this visually here. This is a map of Indochina's five key uh, decentralized autonomous states that together comprise the Indochina Federation. To the west are the protectorate kingdoms of Laos and Cambodia, which are less militarily significant for the story that I'm trying to tell here, but they're really critically important for France's claims to be arbiter between the states of the Federation and also for the regime of minority protections that they attempted uh, successfully to enact here. Then from the north is Tonkin, which is administered in part by the Chinese, but really is the territorial base for the independent Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Below in pink is the former royal protectorate of Annam, split through early 1946 at the 16th parallel between Sino-Viet administrators in the north and Anglo-French in the south. Further south in brown is the directly administered colony of Cochinchin, again a fully French colony, not a protectorate since 1871. From 1946 to 8, the federal administration, they planned two separate independence referenda for this group. Referenda, by the way, although they stated as independence, would actually have made Vietnam's reunification impossible, right? It was independence not from the French Federation or French colonial domination, but independence from the prospect of a united Vietnam. Not only that, they recognized a separatist autonomous provisional republic in Cochin, China, that's outlined in light blue. They carved out an autonomous trusteeship territory for the protection of ethnic minorities in southern Annam, that's outlined in red. And then they did the same thing in 1948 for the so-called Thai ethnic minorities. They formed the Thai Federation in Tonkin, which is outlined in yellow. This here is where reform and mass violence really achieved their deadly embrace. Intermediaries representing these, quote, devolved parastatal entities now had the resources and the political incentives to subjugate their neighbors, and they did. Data isn't very reliable for this period, since there were so many overlapping uh, and competing state authorities. But having read the literature and the numbers, I can state with confidence that at least thousands were killed in southern Indochina from 1945 to 6, and many, many more uh, were displaced as a result of these competing state-building projects. Examining just Cochin China at a more granular level, we can see the dizzying, fractured, and overlapping battle lines of these civil wars even more clearly. As you can see, the French follow the principle of minority protection and decentralized partition all the way down to the local level. So, okay, within this autonomous republic of Cochin China, we observe the detritus of three separate state building projects, all with their own aspirations, all with their own arsenals, and their, their uh, aims for political control. Now, the first are the remains of the revolutionary Viet Minh, who fought France and its allies basically with no breaks from 1945 until France's defeat in the Geneva Conference in 1954. 
Then we have ethno-religious paramilitary groups, including our friends the Khao Dai, fighting with French weapons and support against the Viet Minh, but also sometimes against the Cochin Chinese collaborationist government that the French had installed, and also sometimes against one another. These regimes taxed, conscripted, and often killed the civilians over whom they ruled essentially at will. And these violent predilections, not to mention the direct threat that they imposed to the, the myth of French sovereignty that the French were attempting to weave at this period, it was really no deterrent to the continuation and expansion of this tactic. Right? These groups were just too militarily valuable uh, to rein in. And so by the end of the war in 1954, Subnational paramilitary groups like the Khao Dai numbered in the tens of thousands in the south. Often they they might, may even have outnumbered French regulars in this area. This, in sum, is what the historian Jessica Chapman has dubbed Vietnam's Wild South. Where on a one hour drive out of Saigon in 1947, you could theoretically run into French troops, Binh Zuyen River pirates, Cochin Chinese Republican guards, Viet Minh guerrillas, Cambodian paramilitaries allied to the French, and Khao Dai religious paramilitaries. It was within this fractured landscape, a mosaic of competing ethnostates engineered by civilian reformers, that a new model of counterinsurgency warfare was born. But I, I want to pivot briefly, strap in, we're going across the Indian Ocean, to France's 1947 repression of the Malagasy National Independence Movement, a case I discussed in my dissertation project that I think illustrates here the transnational scope of what I've been discussing for Indochina. In Madagascar, as in Indochina, Free French reformers present in Equatorial Africa in 1940, who went back to the Brazzaville Conference in 44, enacted a parallel project of ethnic territorial partition, another federation, this one called the Gouvernement du Sud, and pictured to the left. It was a, a project executed according to the same faux ethnographic methods, justified with the same recourse to the Charter of the United Nations and minority protections, and upheld with mass violence, just as was the case in southern Indochina. These maps, one of the federation and another of the imagined tribal composition of the island's electoral districts, illustrates this ethnographic principle of reform, right? The idea, this uncritical French idea that equates a subject's ethnic or tribal identity with their perceived political loyalties. And it's a principle that spread across all of the French uh, imperial territories that I study in the dissertation. When in March 1947, local nationalists in Madagascar are frustrated by the, the administration's refusal to even consider the possibility of autonomy rose up in arms. The arsenal that French counterinsurgents brought to bear against them was again practically identical to what we have just seen for Indochina. Extreme violence, forced mass migration through starvation, and the cultivation of ethnic minority partisans to transform national independence struggles into disconnected and fractured racial civil wars. Indeed, here, as in Cochin, China, local paramilitaries recruited from amongst the island's, quote, loyal races, operated as the, the base military unit for defending occupied territory. And this, over the course of the war there, over 100,000 Malagasy died in what is, in my view, a largely understudied but pivotal in the history of French counterinsurgency, an episode. My assertion of the connection between these conflicts, aside from what I think is the recursive quality of the tactics that are used there and the same uh, justifications for violence, are that the civil administrators who laid the foundations for these tactics came from the same professional network. They corresponded with one another and they cited one another as inspiration. For the final segment of this talk, I'm going to discuss three core pillars of this transnational counterinsurgency doctrine that originated in this period and discuss their implications for the subsequent history of counterinsurgency. The first of these doctrinal pillars was the rural collectivity as the base unit of counterinsurgency operations. So this is especially evident in Indochina and Algeria, but in each of the cases I study, including Madagascar, it was to the supposedly apolitical, conservative, and xenophobic peasantry that French counterinsurgents first turned when they were looking to generate loyalty or support for their cause. Based on everything we've heard to this point, right, this, this turn to the peasantry really should come as no surprise. These, these groupings of several rural villages in, in rural collectivities, um, these were the very traditional institutions and ancestral chiefs that reformers all the way back to Ebuwe in 1941 had been valorizing. The competing state building projects that we saw in Cochin, China, these were in fact thousands of local competitions for superiority within these units, the rural collectivities or the commune animite in the case of Cochin, China. 
For the French and their collaborators, right, this was the foundation of the, the project of social engineering necessary to prevail over the Viet Minh. It was not only the administrative container for protecting and enshrining minority rights and law, but it was, it was the very platform through which infrastructure was built, social services were delivered, elections were held, and critically, new irregular troops were recruited. From the start then, the peasant was the political center of gravity for war fighters on all sides of this conflict. Right? And, and contrary to a lot of the subsequent historiography, I don't think that French officers needed to read Mao to understand this basic fact. Right? This was something that administrators from the very start had emphasized. And when we look beyond the spectacular and I, I would say probably more interesting battles of the Indochina War to its daily unfolding, it becomes clear that the, the war more closely resembled a grinding struggle, uh, punctuated by targeted assassinations and moments of spectacular violence that was for control of these rural collectivities. A natural entailment of this focus on peasant social development was the rural self-defense group. These were collections of villagers, often regrouped into more concentrated and defensible positions, armed by the colonial state and tasked with repelling either the Viet Minh or whatever nationalists were opposing them from their assigned zone. So what's most important here is less the military function of this zone, as much as, how, as it's interesting to think of peasants armed with muskets and shotguns I don't think uh, that they were the most reliable fighters out there. Rather, it's, it's the transformation of, of the traditional commune, its chief, and the peasants who lived within it into base units of counterinsurgency warfare. Years later, as they fought in Algeria, French military leaders bemoaned that they had focused too much on spectacular operations and cleanup operations, and that they hadn't situated their operational center of gravity adequately within these peasant masses, like the Viet Minh had. But as we can he see here, this assessment just isn't true, right? Civilian administrators had already piloted this concept. The final legacy and, and where you really begin to see the transformation of France's promises to protect ethnic minorities into a weapon of war is what I call the partisanization and sectarianization of the conflict in the South. The territorial governor uh, of Cochin, China, a committed colonial reformer and one of our main characters, Jean Cédille, he approved plans as early as December 1945 to recruit Cambodians and Catholic partisans, led of course by traditional notables to quote, purge the Viet Minh from the villages outside of Saigon. Cambodians and disaffected religious minorities, Sadil's advisors informed him, could form the quote, backbone of counter guerrilla operations in this region. And so they did. First the administration recruited 1,000, then nearly 8,000 in 1946, and then over 30,000 in 1949. Of course, from the military standpoint, this helped to free troops in what was basically the DRV's uh, operational center of gravity in the northern Vietnam, and we shouldn't neglect the military facts on the ground. But I think it's impossible to understand the composition of partisan forces and the political ideology and benefits that they were able to reap from the French, namely local control over decentralized rural collectivities and protected legal statuses. We can't understand that without looking at the reformers who brought this tactic into existence. So when France finally conceded in 1949 to non-communist Vietnamese nationalists and granted independence to a reunited Vietnamese state, this effort to create real Vietnamese sovereignty was hampered from the very start because administrators and their military replacements had just promised too many carve-outs, too many differentiated rights, and too many special privileges to the partisans that were already operating there. So these phenomena, the partisanization and ethnic sectarianization of the war in China, they came to define what the French saw as a relatively successful record of counterinsurgency in this region. So impressive were the results from this campaign that in late 1947, another French commander, Raoul Salon, who would also later command all of French forces in French Algeria and then become the head of the right-wing terrorist organization, the Organisation de l'Armée Secrète in the early, late 1950s and early 1960s, as early as 1947, he ordered his subordinates to pursue a pilot program on an identical basis to the one that we just saw in the South in the North. That was, exploit to the maximum, quote, the differences of race, religion, and mystique to recruit partisans adapted to the country and charged with assuring territorial security. By this point, both the initial generation of Gaullist reformers and the fractured federal model that they had tried to build in, in Cochin, China, were beginning to be phased out by the government in Paris. Having chosen to support a more unified national Vietnam as a counterweight to Ho Chi Minh, France scaled down its territorial partitions to the minority populations in the north and center of Vietnam, also, of course, uh, leaving alone the religious sects in the south 
who basically were too essential and refused to give up uh, their territorial autonomy. Yet even as the political project that had enabled ethno-religious separatism as an instrument of war gave way to ideas for a unified and semi-independent Vietnamese state, which is what historians call the Bao Dai solution, it's pictured on this slide. The, mo the tactical framework for this highly racialized model of counterinsurgency had already been locked into place. So when 10 years later, the architects of France's revolutionary warfare doctrine, they theorized about local peasants, innate racial divisions to be exploited, or even the territorial basis for conducting counterinsurgency operations, and guess what, it was the rural village. They were drawing on this work of a, of a forgotten class of civilian administrators. One of Salon's subordinates, responding to a request to recruit partisans in Tonkin, communicated a dilemma that I leave you with here. How was he re to recruit these paramilitaries in the north, he complained. Since a small ethnic Hmong minority notwithstanding, quote, there were no racial differences with which he could stoke opposition or provoke hostile feelings. This was the final evolutionary stage in the doctrine of racial flourishing that we've studied today. It was just a more or less naked attempt to stoke racial civil war. Ultimately, though, in Tonkin, as in Algeria, which is pictured in this slide as a juxtaposition, a colony's imagined lack of racial diversity was really no obstacle for manufacturing intercommunal conflict and violence. It was the substance of colonial reforms themselves. The way that Free French Republicans saw, tried to organize colonial and especially rural life after 1941 that defined the contours of this intercommunal bloodletting both at the local level and across the national context. Without our Brazzaville diaspora, decolonization probably would have been extremely violent, right? I, I think that that's absolutely true. But so eager were the Gaullists of 1945 to prove that the nationalist revolutionaries they confronted did not speak for the majority of the population. Indeed, that there was no Vietnamese Malagasy or Algerian nationalism to speak of at all. That they repurposed their plans for Ebuwe's peaceful revolution into an accelerant for mass violence. Local actors certainly had agency here, right? Actors like Tak, they navigated what I've called the empire's fractured mosaic with all of its dangers and opportunities really skillfully. But there was something structural here that made these patterns of conflict repeat, repeat across the empire and across 16 years. By the onset of the Algerian War of Independence in 1954, the face of French counterinsurgency was of course no longer from Tak. Yet because of the alliances that our early generation of Gaulists had chosen to forge, and because of the doctrines they had chosen to embrace, there were now many Algerian intermediaries who were just as ambitious and just as violent as he was. So I have policy implications for there. any political scientists who are interested. We can talk about them. Otherwise, uh, I open the floor to Q&A. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you so much. Um, this was Christian. Um, I have a number of questions ranging from, none of them are policy implication questions, so I guess I'm being a bad political scientist. It's okay, it really um, is. But I want to invite um, everyone else, it's uh, guests go first, and students go first usually, mm -hmm. is a norm. Well, I guess I'll take a stab at it. Please. Um, hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Also, I mean, stunning um, piece of work. I'm sort of, in my own mind, thinking through sort of parallels that <clears throat> emerge at least from the colonial experiment in the Caribbean, for instance, for context, and from Jamaica, as, of course, product of British Empire. So, um, and the sort of parallels that existed there, in my mind, which sort of came ringing back to me was this idea of faculty and the side, if you will. Um, I guess, in sort of thinking about this particular question, um, you know, you sort of mentioned this idea of this particular ontology of race that was sort of echoed through the sort of entire exercise there in, in, in colonial France, and the sort of, dare I call it, juxtaposition that seems to exist now in the Département de Mer, and, you know, particularly in, 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 um, in the Caribbean, of course, in Réunion, and, and so on, and that sort of shift I'm interested in sort of seeing how, or how you sort of seen that shift, how that played out, and why exactly this particular project was the sort of precedent for that new sort of um, you know, identity, if you will, of the sort of hexagonal and also you know, overseas friends as well. Well, thank you for that question. I really appreciate it. So are we just doing question and answer? Just one at a time, yeah. Absolutely. So 
Uh, I think that the like the move to a more sort of strident assimilationism, right? The the invent what the historian Todd Shepard calls the invention of decolonization, the idea that really France was always intending to shed its colonial territories once they they sort of established a, a certain degree of uh, social evolution, and that decolonization was actually France's gift to the world, uh, right? I think that this is a a real intimate product of this particular period, right? In the French Union, so in 1941 especially, they're basically, Eboué is willing to embrace um, plural, he understands that nationalism, or that at least uh, like ethnic identity that expresses itself sort of like nationalism, mm -hmm. is an inevitable part. It's tied to the, the like land itself, right? So in a really almost kind of uh, Vichyite way of thinking about it, there's a lot of actual parallels in the ideology of the Free French Republicans and the collaborationist Vichyites, um, he views sort of uh, canalizing ethnic sort of nationalism or ethnic identity as a political identity uh, through territory, right? So we have the territorialization of ethnicity and uh, the construction of these like federations basically uh, that are designed to protect ethnic, separat uh, ethnic separatism. But as, you, as we saw today, right, that project just doesn't work out, right? The, the French are completely wrong in how they understand uh, the social organization of the colonies that they're operating in, right? The, the so-called new and cutting-edge social scientific methods that they apply are just nonsense, basically. And uh, obviously they have like uh, vested political interests in perpetuating this. And my argument is that even though these categories are not uh, incredibly meaningful to people on the ground, that the French sort of inflict uh, political and financial incentives, or they, they concreti concretize these differences, with uh, political and financial incentives in ways that have created lasting social trauma in the areas like Madagascar especially, but also Vietnam and Algeria, uh, where these wars were allowed to happen. But the sort of transformation you are seeing is basically around 1958 uh, is what the last time that the French tried to do this federation idea, and they do it in Algeria, ethno-separatism and ethnic particularism, and then the military stage is a coup. They're just like, sorry, we're not, this isn't working for us. Not particularly because of this doctrine, but just they think the civilian administration isn't really strong enough. And they, the French uh, army goes with something called integration, which is like, we are making all 100 million people into like uh, white French peasants, basically. Like we will all be peasants together and like really French identity. And as the empire falls apart after 1958, really there's a huge wave of decolonization after 58 that culminates, as you probably know, in Algeria's independence in 62. That like assimilationist predilection serves far beyond what the military thought it would. And so there's a sort of scaling down of identity to just what France always was was the hexagon and then everyone else is just like we're making them into model Frenchmen. But that was really, in my view, uh, a pragmatic political choice that stemmed from the failure of everything that they had tried uh, before that. But thank you for your question. Yeah, yeah. can you, um, do we know when de Gaulle, so to speak, changed his mind? Um, you know, he, he leaves power, uh, he's, he's focused on this, he's a part of it, make, making the decision. But at some time or other, he must have rethought all these things and comes back into power and, and drops it off. Or tries or tries to tries to have this kind of co French Commonwealth right. in, instead. Uh, so I think so. In specifically the Indochina context, De Gaulle is like absolutely critical to the elaboration of this particular doctrine. Right? He is with uh, Thierry Dalgenlieu, the the like high commissioner from the start, and even as he leaves. He sends a missive to his basically loyalists who are still in charge in Indochina saying no, uh, no cooperation with the Viet Minh, like we just need to show them force. And basically his subordinates, because of how power has become decentralized, they go with it. And that's what starts the war. Um, but to answer your question specifically, he comes in in 1958 on the back of this military coup. And my view is that he's basically ready to do the empire. He's, I think that he uh, revises his conception of what the French imperial uh, sort of polity should be like in response to the fact that the FLN, the Algerian Nationalist Independence Movement, basically completely refuses his uh, peace offering after May 1958 and that um, he sees the setbacks that France is facing in the international arena, as well as the breakthroughs in the development of nuclear technologies as a sort of way to do to pivot his policy towards a more a European facing and hexagonal for foreign policy. But so we know in 1959 he does a self-determination speech where he's like, okay, Algeria can ha be independent. 
So there's the window I think for him changing his mind is like late 1958 to mid 1959 is when he realizes that even though France is operating at the peak of its military effectiveness, that a they're the practices of torture and mass violence are discrediting them internationally and also rotting the uh, political like coherence of the French military and also that they're just not going to be the Algerians just are not going to accept the like imperial offer that he has uh, he has tendered to them and the sub-saharan african uh, colonies even if they might have accepted it in his view algeria was the pivot point everything in sub-saharan africa was dependent on the maintenance of uh, french presence in algeria and so if he couldn't do that then basically French Commonwealth is out, uh, Hexagon is in, in my opinion. Um, I'll, I'll ask a question. Sure. Three, actually. I love it. <laughs> um, so you were, ta- you were said at the beginning of your talk that this model diffused outward further to like military juntas in um, Argentina and Brazil. But I'm wondering if there's a diffusion story in the front end as well. Like where... In a contemporaneous sense, where do the French cook this uh, this little plot up? Um, because it's not coming organically from France. Because the you know the creation of France was done through force and centralization, nothing to do with the preservation of local identities or languages, and it's the classic centralized control case of um, of nation building and state building. And so they're not getting it from any domestic you know population control methods. And um, as a political science work on this, very famously, David Layton about like Yoruba, I was just looking at the title of the book, The Yoruba Land, uh, and, and it tie, ties the, this innovation, I'm just going to neutrally call it an innovation, you know, even though I'm not assessing um, uh, normative <laughs> <laughs> you know, qualities to it. But um, you're saying that kind of the French innovated this, but the British actually innovated something very similar. 50 years earlier, just kind of like messing around with ethnicity, race, religion, and assigning categories, you know, that later had serious weight. They didn't do so kind of with the goal of um, mayhem, you know. Um, They did so kind of almost just, um, like almost just an experiment from what I know and read um, without really, um, so I'm kind of just wondering where, where this came from, what they were referencing, you know, in this, in in this, in this, effort to do this. I understand that they were inspired by, um, you know, self-determination uh, rhetoric, but actually the model of federalism is totally foreign to France. Um, and so I'm interested in where, like, the boomerang of that is. Um, so, yeah, I have a couple other questions, but that was my first one. Uh, so, yes, you are absolutely right that they did not cook this up in Paris. And, I mean, so basically, if you could just transport yourself uh, to Equatorial Africa in 1940, which is a pretty dark time for being a free French person, uh, they're surrounded by uh, basically Vichy territory to the north that is hostile to them, like really hostile. And then they have Belgians and English basically nearby them. And for their inspiration, so they draw on the British model of indirect rule pretty explicitly actually. But also there's a French heritage uh, from the pre-war period called associationism. So the, I don't want to, I don't have to get into the weeds of like French colonial ideology, but they have assimilationism, which we explained earlier today, right? Transforming primarily Africans into French people. Uh, And then they have what they call associationism, which is the idea of uh, a more indirect model of rule or a rule that respects, quote, African custom and tradition. And in the past, basically these, these two forms of rule coexisted and they were more, in my view, just like ideological labels for what was essentially just naked exploitation. But uh, after 1941, Ibuwe specifically is really railing explicitly against the centralizing tendencies of the French state. Right? There's a line he says, we can't make the Africans uh, follow our revolution, the French revolution, the, this like centralizing um, kind of impulse or this centralizing state building impulse. Uh, But the real innovation for the French isn't the idea of traditional institutions or invented ethnicity or rule by chiefs. And also, I don't actually think that the French explicitly did this originally to stir up mayhem. I think that they actually thought of this as like a model for um, political, what they call political evolution, right? Where local communities learn like political practice and they develop. I mean, it's a very like patronizing and paternalistic model. But they actually imagined stability. Yes, they really did. Yeah, they were really committed to, uh, but the difference is that it's paired with this program of 
um, economic and social development, right? A renunciation of what they call the colonial pact, where they extract resources from the colonies, they uh, create finished goods, and then they sell them back to the, the captive markets, right? So in 1941, Ibuwe imagines an unprecedented investment from the metropole of funds, expertise, technical knowledge to the colonies in order to facilitate this kind of decentralized uh, development, to raise living standards in a way that was not commensurate, but at least began to rival the French metropole. And it's, it's my view that we had the ideology and then this, these development initiatives are what furnish the actual funding, like, like the money and the weapons that make the civil wars uh, a possibility. So that's the kind of, that's what separates them from the associationism of the past. Okay. It's like a, there is really a genuine commitment on the part of French reformers to like put their money where their mouth is. Except that it just so happens that where they dump all this money are areas where there's already national revolutionary movements that are opposing them. And so all this money just goes to, as like basically gasoline to fuel uh, local intercommunal disputes over resources. So, just from like a presentist uh, point of view, it almost looks like it was done to create mayhem. Yes, After absolutely. You talk, it almost looks like it was done. You know, like in that, like it, it looks like experimental uh, torture or something. So they start all this stuff out though before there is violence. Well, in Indochina, there's, but in Madagascar, for example, they have like three years where they're doing these reforms and they think that it's going to be like a great laboratory of democracy and regional identity and development. And then all of a sudden, there's not really all of a sudden, but then the insurrection of 1947 happens, the revolution I contend of 1947 happens, and they just pivot like reflexively from here's money to develop infrastructure to like these same communities and intermediaries, here's all these guns, you need to kill these ethnicities that are like rebels, they call them turbulent races, right? So Kind of it's, like the EU's response to the migration crisis. Yes, there, yeah, it's, yes, exactly. <laughs> I have a dumb, so I don't want to suck up everyone's time, but I have a kind of a dumb counterpart question to that. And I know there are no dumb questions, but when there professors are. say there are dumb questions, there are dumb questions, mm -hmm. here's my dumb question. It's parallel to that question. I was asking about the indigeneity of the federal model, which isn't indigenous to uh, territorial France. Oh, yes. So what about the indigeneity of um, race and ethnicity for thee, but not for me? I mean, that is fascinating to me. Uh, what, what is the justification by these thinkers that everyone else has race and ethnicity, but France doesn't at the subnational level? That's, I mean, that's where I feel like, am I missing something here? Uh, yeah, so my supposition is that the idea of colorblind Republican France is something that's basically a really recent invention and that it's been projected backwards to make it seem like a timeless quality of the revolution because they are, they really care about race, like a lot. And they, they have all these, oh, well, actually they say, oh no, race has been totally discredited by the Second World War and Nazism. We just care about ethnicity and tribe, right? But then of course, sometimes they slip and still say race. So it's like, a, it's just basically the transposition of uh, ideas about racial difference into not even a less explicit cultural vernacular. They're still using all the same assumptions of the colonial past, but just dressed up a little bit in the language of cultural anthropology or social science. But it's really the same thing. That's a policy relevant piece out of this too, by the oh, way. Oh, there you go, okay. <laughs> what is it, the French talk about race. <laughs> I'd love to hear some of the French diplomats who'd lectured at me in the past uh, read that. <laughs> and I totally believe in the promise of the French Revolution, by the way. Even though this has been like I'm banging on France and how bad they are. I, I, it's, again, I'm a tourism ad for France. <laughs> Thank you for indulging me those. No, no, of course. No, it's really it's important stuff. Sure. Uh, um, I also have a question. Uh, first of all, really interesting. I learned a lot. Uh, I do not study France. I do not study uh, decolonization. I study political economy of security and defense industry. So this is uh, this is a little bit different than what I usually read and, and listen to and engage with. But I'm really interested in the diffusion point, especially internationally, to Brazil, Argentina, the U.S. Um, how? I'm getting to the slide. Sorry. Yeah. There you go. Like, how did that end up happening? And where I, I know the, the it's kind of the Cold War era, but where do we still see the legacies today outside of those countries? You know, in current counterinsurgencies and domestic strife in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where the French sometimes intervene, sometimes they don't. Now Russia is uh, being invited to uh, 
to participate, uh, intervene, however, however we want to, you know, describe that. Um, where do we see uh, legacies there? And then I actually really like the policy implications of the constructive counterinsurgency because there's this, uh, I'm sure you know the big literature on, you know, war making, state making, and is it, you know, state capacity that leads to better outcomes in war, or is right. it war driving that? And like, I mean, it's, it's cyclical, but this, get, you know, this was really interesting because there's a, a piece by, uh, the names are Taylor and Botea from like 28, uh, 2008 or 2010 that basically, you know, argue that, you know, Vietnam compared to other um, third world countries is a successful case in state building and state capacity due to uh, the experience of the uh, Indochina war taking on uh, different French institutions. Uh, and the North is ultimately more successful because they have to deal with stuff more by themselves. Than, um, than the South. And I, I, I'll, I'll send you I just, send, j just that, um, but yeah. Okay, so to answer the diffusion point, so I wish that I had been the one who thought of this and discovered it, but there's actually a wonderful article by uh, one of my mentors named Terrence Peterson that's called Networking the Counter-Revolution. And essentially what it says is that the, so even as the French were facing defeat in their colonial wars, a, there were exchanges of French, uh, of European and NATO, but also of uh, South American officers. So they would, and the, you can find this in the British archives as well, but they embedded uh, officers within French paratrooper units and French combat units in Algeria uh, for a kind of like, they, they use it as sort of diplomatic capital, but also the transmission of doctrine, right? Everyone wanted to see what the French were uh, cooking up, so to speak, in Algeria. And then uh, more concretely, the Ecole, non, uh, Ecole de Guerre, I think it is, the like French Defense University in Paris, is um, there's just an excellent uh, spreadsheet basically of all like critical and major figures in the Argentine, especially uh, the Junta, that circulated into that school, took classes on, they basically, they called it the French method of war, but revolutionary warfare, and then exported it um, almost verbatim as doctrine, translated into Spanish, right? French doctrine into Spanish, and then used it in their own uh, dirty war. Also, French officers uh, that were experienced in this, actually French war criminals, frankly, right? People who uh, later actually went to jail for torturing people or who faced um, national humiliation. They were stripped of their rights. They went to, they led a lot of the commando warfare at Fort Bragg. There's a I'm sorry that I can't, Paul Ossosares, he, he wrote a book called The Battle of the Caspa, where he basically admits to torturing and murdering a bunch of people uh, as a paratrooper in the Battle of Algiers. But he was one of the main trainer, trainers of the early uh, US Green Berets before the Vietnam War, right? So there's like a, a professional network, a professional modality for the circulation of this kind of doctrine. But the main vehicle is the university system and then the uh, embedded, the military attaches who embed uh, or who sort of facilitate the embedding of foreign officers uh, within French military units. And, and you can really see it again in the, the citations of a lot of our, our doctrine of the present day. Also David Galula, the like counterinsurgent intellectual, uh, he, he's pictured there, pacification in Algeria. Basically, uh, th this one was more happenstance where a veteran of the Algerian war uh, goes to the RAND Corporation and writes this like game-changing report just before the US war in Vietnam. And this uh, particular report uh, David Petraeus cites it as like a critical inspiration for the counterinsurgency field manual. Okay, to answer your next question. So the Mali, the relevance of this project to, the, to France's choices to intervene and not intervene. So uh, unfortunately, this is like the classic historian's answer, which is I am really comfortable with my area of expertise, but I, I don't want to uh, speak unfairly or sort of like inappropriately about the present. All I can tell you is that the French model, like the French extrapolate a model of partner warfare from this particular, these sets of experiences that I think are, are at least somewhat relevant. Although the, the choices of when to intervene and when not to intervene, the only relevance I can see there is that it's the military that, it, that basically installs the new presidential French Republic. And so they install the political regime that can make those choices to intervene in conflicts like this unhampered from parliamentary approval, right? So that's the only area that I could speak directly. But uh, I guess my 
Next uh, policy relevant thing to do is learn more about, I mean, I know about the intervention in Mali, obviously, or in the Sahel generally, but I, it's, I, I don't want to make connections that are inappropriate. Um, the final point about the um, war making, oh yeah, state capacity building. Yes, so this really is interesting because the French are pumping money into state capacity building and it's literally, uh, the stronger the Vietnamese separatist states are, like in Cochin, China, or the fiefdoms, the more capable they are, the more violent they, they can be, basically, right? So the political incentives, just because you're culturally aware and you are, um, well, you're funding the, the host nation partners in ways that allow them to sort of like develop infrastructure or do the sort of the performance of democracy or, or follow whatever uh, cultural objectives you're asking them to follow. There is basically, at least in the cases I study, very little correlation between uh, these kinds of programs and the uh, de-escalation of conflicts. In any case, it's where, the, again, French reformers were more, most robust that we see the most extreme cases of violence or at least the, the crystallization of certain counterinsurgency doctrines. Uh, so, constructive, just let's not do counterinsurgency, you know, is basically the takeaway from this, as much as I'm interested in it. I have, uh, does anyone want to ask a question? Anybody? I, I want to make space for others. Um, I have one question that I wanted to ask you. I'm kind of obsessed with states decentering themselves from a situation. I have a book manuscript that is stalled out uh, during the pandemic, but about the impulse to outsource uh, uh, security actions to uh, market actors. And so yes, I'm talking about things like Blackwater and everything, but I'm also talking about just other aspects of the administrative state. Um, so I'm just absolutely obsessed with that mechanism of states saying, wh whether we're talking about proxy warfare or, um, or uh, um, secret uh, operations, but also outsourcing and market behavior. So I'm, I really picked up on that other innovation of, of de the French decentering themselves in this. Can you tell me more for, about their contemporaneous uh, understanding about what that would do, the kind of hiding of their own interests through others, what they said about it at the time, what they expected? Because I see that as a larger mechanism, you know, that, that has many different impulses in many domains and places in time. That's, yes, so I think one of the, the cornerstones of this French imperial project is what they call decentralization. And it's an aspect that it has sort of just been lost, I guess, in the historiography. I don't really understand why, but the French are hammering about it. From Eboué all the way to 1947, the idea of uh, rebalancing decision-making authority, authority in the colonies away from the colonial ministry in Paris towards territorial governors, but really it's towards ethnographic experts and these local deliberative institutions that they think the whole empire is going to be built along this basis, basically. And uh, the reason that they do that, so they profess outwardly, that it's because only through decentralization, the devolution of political rights, and uh, sort of allowing them to prosper within their own traditions, following their own social hierarchies, that they'll achieve the, what they describe as political maturity, to like have genuine um, independence, or at least to participate as members of this French commonwealth. Uh, but what I think it actually does, it's not a, a renunciation of their economic commitments, right? The French are decentralizing political power and then pouring all this money into um, the empire, which is a little bit paradoxical. But what it instead does is I think it outsources the management of the like day-to-day -day functioning of the empire. It creates a new intermediary class um, with a sort of its own unique set of political incentives to perpetuate the imperial project. And I also think it just generally satisfies the sort of French ethnographic obsession, the, the need to, right, they're, they're really concerned that national independence movements are going to coalesce. And so their objective is to, uh, it's called containerize. They want to inscribe ethnic identity literally in territory to make any possibility of a national coalition impossible, right? They want to renounce the, the, the they want to deny that any such nation exists, right? That's what uh, the this federation in Madagascar is all about, right? They literally segregate the 
in Marina, which is in, in red, that's, what, that's the base of sort of Malagasy nationalism. And then all these so-called underdeveloped races in the south, they literally just draw a hard territorial border between them. They have completely separate administrative regimes. They're put in opposition to one another economically, right? So it's just a, the, it's basically perpetuating French imperial power um, by inscribing ethnic religious difference into the very foundations of the, the functioning of empire. So it's not as much a deferral as it is kind of a, like a way to shore up their power in this world of nation-state decolonization that we have after 1945. I see even more parallels in your answer to the other outsourcing phenomenon. I would love to read your manuscript. I hope it doesn't stay stalled out forever. Well, it'll eventually. Yes, no pressure. Yes. 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 Of course, no pressure. All right, everyone. Well, join me in thanking you. Thank you.